Hello friends, this is Mrs. Wright reading chapter one from Under the Egg. It was the find of the century, or so I thought at the time. This was back when a great day meant finding a toaster oven on the curb with a sign reading, works good, or scoring a bag of day old danishes, slightly stale, which tastes like heaven after months of plain oatmeal. Manhattan's treasures aren't hard to find. You just have to look, ignore the skyscrapers and shop windows for a minute and look down. You'll see people here shed possessions like dandruff. I'm not complaining. I found clothes, toys, school supplies, enough books to open my own library branch. The sidewalks of New York are like an outdoor shopping mall where everything is free. One time I found two Barney's bags full of moth-eaten cashmere sweaters. It only took $3.25 in quarters to shrink them in the laundromat, and I was able to use the thick felted wool to make a new winter jacket stuffed with feathers from some old down pillows. All the leftover sweater arms I sewed together into leggings. The scraps I patched into a school bag with my name, Theodora Tenpenny, and bordered with thread I pulled out of a hotel sewing kit I found in my grandfather's dresser. Another time I found a mint condition snowboard. It makes a decent bookshelf. Of course, this was back when I thought the greatest things you could find on the streets of New York were things. But I'm getting ahead of myself. I was coming back from the hardware store on one of those sweltering July days when you can't decide which is hotter, the sun beating down on you or the pavement radiating beneath you. From the sticky sound of each step, I could tell that the soles of my sneakers were starting to melt. What was left of my sneakers, that is. My kids had seen me through the seventh grade, but they couldn't keep up with my summer growth spurt. I'd already slipped the canvas to free my toes and strain the laces to their limit. But as I flapped my way past Hudson Street's Korean tapas bar, and bespoke bicycle boutiques. It was clear that something had to give, most likely the seams. By then I saw it just as I turned the corner onto our street, Spinny Lane, a pair of shoes perched on top of a mailbox. Not the neighborhood's usual discarded pair of glamour queen high heels, but sneakers brand new and on closer inspection, exactly my size. Five and a half extra wide. Yes, the colors were garish, and the owner had, for some reason, hand-painted them with graffiti. But they fit. That's all that mattered. I grabbed them before they could attract any competition, and peeling my skirt, really a yellow cotton petticoat I'd found in the attic, off my sweaty thighs, I plopped down on the hot curb. But as I pulled off my keds, I could hear my grandfather, Jack's voice. What? Plenty of life in those shoes. Well, if you must, here, hand me those laces. I can find a use for them. I stopped for a moment to savor my treasure-finding triumph when the taxi in front of me peeled away, revealing a dark, sticky spot in the middle of the street. At first glance, you'd think it was oil spill or gum burned black by the sun. It had only been a couple of months ago, but it felt like years already. I had rounded Spinney Lane as I always did on my way home from school, but this time I saw the street was at a standstill behind a barricade of ambulances and police cars. Trucks' horns blared and whined. A bike messenger and cab driver pointed fingers and cursed in various languages. I peered into the middle of the commotion and saw Jack. He was lying on the ground, thick, red blood puddled underneath him. My own blood went cold. It didn't matter how fast I ran to him. He was already halfway gone. As soon as my face crossed into his line of vision, he struggled to lift his head. It's under the egg, he rasped, his once icy blue eyes now foggy. Look under the egg. The EMTs told me to keep him talking. What is Jack? I said, my mind whirling between the things I knew I should say and the things I really needed to ask. What's under the egg? There's a letter. His speech became more labored as blood gurgled up through his lips and a treasure. He closed his eyes, summoning the strength to whisper before it's too late. The rest of the day exists only in fragments. 
the ambulance ride, the young doctor's sweaty hand on my shoulder, the police escort home despite my insistence that I was perfectly all right to walk, the strange little song my mom hummed as the cop spoke to her. I knew that she had stopped listening and returned to the theorems in her head. That was the day the ten pennies of 18 Spinney Lane went from three to two, and really from two to one, because without Jack, everything we had now weighed on me, which is why Jack told me, with his last words, where to find the one thing that would change everything.